today we're talking law of signs. The goal is to solve triangles using the law of signs. So the triangles we're messing with here are not necessarily right triangles. There's a triangle, no right triangle in sight. So how can we find, given some pieces of information, we need at least three pieces of information about this triangle. How can we find the missing pieces of information? The information being either angles or lengths of sides. First of all, some labeling. Uh, the angle corresponding with this vertex here, uh, we're gonna call that angle A, okay? Uh, so this angle here is actually what we're calling angle A. Likewise, the angles corresponding with what we're naming the vertices of the triangle. So this would be angle C, this would be uh, angle B. And then the sides opposite the angles we use lowercase letters for. So uh, the length of this side here, since it's opposite uh, angle A, we're gonna call it, we're gonna call that length lowercase a. So angle uppercase A, or uppercase in general, and then the opposite side, the length of the opposite side, lowercase. Okay? All right, so then how do we come up with, using a little bit of trig that we already know, how do we come up with uh, an equation or a relationship that will help us solve the triangle for the missing sides or the missing angles given three pieces of information, either angles or sides? Now, uh, except it, it, it will never work You'll never be able to find the missing bits of information if all you're given uh, is the angles, right? If you're given all three angles, then there are a, you know, uh, an infinite number of triangles that can have those three angles, perhaps. So you have to be given the length of at least one side, two angles, maybe two sides and one angle, and then you'll be able to find the missing bits of information. I'll talk more about that in just a few minutes, but let's go ahead and derive the law of signs. So I'm gonna drop an altitude from angle C, which simply means you're dropping a perpendicular to the opposite side from angle C, like so. And can you see the two right triangles I've created then? Yeah, I've created uh, this right triangle uh, here, and this right triangle, the, right, the lo little right triangle on the left and the, and the little right triangle on the right. So I've created two right triangles, and why, why do we want to create right triangles? Why do we care? Well, the Pythagorean theorem is nice for right triangles, but also right triangle trigonometry that we already know about, the Sokotoa is nice for, uh, for right triangles. So let me ask you guys this, if we call this the length of this altitude h, h for height, can you tell me in terms of H and angle A, perhaps, what the sine, and, and one of the other sides, what the sine of angle A is? So look at the left-hand right triangle. It would be H over the hypotenuse, which is B in that case. The left-hand side A to C is, is what we're calling B. Would you agree with that? Now focus your eyes on the right-hand right triangle, this guy. Focus your eyes on that guy. And tell me what the sine of angle B is. Opposite, it's again, just the so part of Sokotoa, right? So it'd be H, the opposite over the hypotenuse in this case is A. Everybody agree with those two statements? All right, solve both of those two statements for H. What would, if, if I got H by itself for the, from this first statement, sine A equals H over B, what would H equal? B sine A, B times sine A, right? And if I solve the second statement for H, what would I get? H equals A, little a, times sine B. So now we've got two equations here, and. On one side, uh, we have H in both the equations. So what can we say about the right sides? What can we say about this right side and this right side? They're, they're equal. So we can say, and this is one version, I suppose, of the law of sines. We can say B sine A is equal to A sine B, except you won't see it written that way in any book. 
I think most book, there's different ways you could write it, but most books are gonna put the lengths of the sides on top, but that it won't be true with all books. So what could I do then uh, to accomplish that? Well, check it out. If I wanted to leave B on this side, what could I divide by? If I wanted to leave B on this side, I could divide by sine A. And I'd have to do that on the right side as well to balance things out. If I wanted to leave A, little a, on this side, what would I have to divide by? Sine B, so I'd have to do that to the left side as well. And then when the dust settles, we're gonna have our, our, our most of our law of sines anyway. What's gonna cancel here? On the left side, one fa sine A divided by itself makes one, right? On the right side, Sine B divided by itself makes one, so we're left with A on this side, we're left with B on this side, on top anyway. And then overall on the left side, we're left with B divided by sine B. And what are we left with on the right? A over sine A. A, over sine A. There's the law of sines. Now there's one piece of the puzzle that we left out. You'd have to draw, you'd have to drop a different perpendicular to derive the next equal to, to derive what what these guys are both equal to, but it shouldn't come as a big surprise then that these two are going to equal c to sine c. Okay, so I, I kind of added that in. We can't derive this last piece from the picture we drew, but I'm going to leave that to you. Okay, this is it. This is the law of sines, you guys. So. Uh, when can you use the law of signs? These two triangles, they're not, obviously they're not the same triangle, right? But they are congruent. And notice the little scribbling I have in red there. So what I'm saying by, by marking this angle and putting a single slash through it, and mark it, so marking this angle and putting a single slash through it, and marking this one, putting a, a single slash through it, I'm saying these two angles are equal. Remember that notation? Okay. Likewise with these two angles, and then these two sides, right? So I'm saying these corresponding sides that I've marked, and, and these corresponding, well, the, the two corresponding sides that I've marked, and the angles that I've marked, the corresponding angles that I've marked are congruent, okay? But notice I put two slash marks through this angle, two through this angle to indicate it doesn't have to be the same measurement as the first angle, right? Okay. So then that's enough to say, having those angles and those sides congruent, or congruent meaning the same uh, either length if they're sides or measure if they're angles, saying that those are congruent are enough to say that those two triangles are congruent. Do you remember what property that is? We say these two triangles are congruent. These two, okay, triangles are congruent by the angle side angle property. Does that sound familiar? Angle ASA, angle side angle. So if you can show that two different triangles have a corresponding angle that's congruent, two corresponding angles that are congruent respectively, and an included side, right? Those sides are in between the two angles. Then the two triangles are congruent by the angle side angle property. Does that sound familiar? Okay. Well, there's other relationships that you can use to prove congruence. There's a problem with one of these. If you can show that all three sides of two separate triangles are congruent, then the two triangles are congruent. If you can show that a side, an included angle, and another side um, of two triangles are congruent, uh, then, the, the, then the two triangles themselves are congruent. This one, uh, this one it has a problem. I'll talk about that in a second. And then uh, the last one, if you can show that two angles and a non-included, notice the order. When you, when you list the two angles first without the S in between, that's a different situation than saying side angle side. So if you can show that two angles on a not included side, um, two corresponding angles 
and two corresponding sides not included on two different triangles are congruent, then the two triangles themselves are congruent. Does all that sound familiar to you? Okay. Now this, this case here, the side-side angle case, is uh, ambiguous. When uh, does the law of sines work? It's easier to say when the law of sines doesn't work. The law of sines doesn't work. In other words, you don't have the right information to apply the law of sines with these two. You're actually going to use the law of cosines, which we're going to talk about next time, for those two. And then for the other cases, including uh, angle side angle, uh, so including angle side angle and these two uh, lower cases here, including the ambiguous case, you can use the law of sines. Uh, in this first example, we're going to solve the triangle, and we're in the situation where we're given uh, two angles and a non-included side. We call it the angle-angle side case. Now, notice I'm not, I'm not comparing two triangles here. It's just where the terminology comes from. Um, so I'm, giving, uh, uh, I'm given that I have two angles and a non-included side. Is it easy to see that that's the situation? Maybe not at first, but you could draw it. Um, if, you, if you draw a, a triangle, and it doesn't matter how you label it, uh, A, B, C, then, uh, oh, and oh, well, I should draw it fairly realistically. So I, I notice that A is obtuse, so maybe I should draw it like that and make this A, this B, and this C. So uh, I'm given A, A is 135. I'm given B is 30. And I'm giving side B. Which side is side B? The opposite of B. So, so now is it clear? I'm given an angle, an angle, and a non-included side. And my claim is law of signs will work on that every single time to find the missing bits of the triangle. Does that make sense to you? OK, uh, so do you need to draw that picture to, to solve the problem? Absolutely not. In fact, once you get proficient at this, drawing the pictures is a waste of time. So uh, notice what you're given. Uh, take another look at the law of sines again. You only need two out of these three equalities in any given problem at any given time. OK, so which relationship do you want to set up? The, the, which equality do you want to set up? The one involving uh, A's and C's, B's and C's, A's and B's, A's and B's. OK. So we're going to use the, uh, the equality that says A sine A is equal to B sine B. And just fill it in. And you'll fill it in with what you know, I mean, and then what you, what you don't know will be obvious, right? OK, so um, fill it in for me. What do we get? A over oh, let's not go there yet. A over sine of? 135 equals 20 over sine of 30. OK. Technically, I don't know if, if you would even consider this a trig equation, because the unknown is not the argument of the trig function. But it ha does have trig functions involved. So I guess you could call it a trig, trig, uh, trig equation, but it's a really simple one, right? Because the sine of 135 is a constant number, the sine of 30 is a constant number, so it actually breaks down to a linear equation, a true linear equation. So uh, yeah, whenever you can, get exact numbers. I agree with that. So uh, somebody told me what the sine of 135 is. What is it? So we can go ahead and, and replace it here with root 2 over 2. But it might, wait, wait, wait. It might be easier to go ahead and s solve for a first. Or I don't know if it's easier, but it's different. So if I wanted to solve for a first, which I recommend doing when you don't know, when you don't have a special angle. Solve for the missing length first. So what could I do to get a by itself? What could I multiply both sides by? Just this denominator, right? So just multiply both sides by sine 135. It ends up in the numerator on the right side. And then you have an exact expression for A. 
Uh, A is equal to 20 sine 135 divided by sine 30. Now, it, it just so happens that we can get an exact answer here, but usually in the homework you won't. So at this point, you'll run this through your calculator in the homework. Now, because we can get an exact answer, let's go ahead and do it. On top, 20 sine 135, you already told me, is rad 2 over 2. So on top, we get 20 times rad 2 over 2. On bottom, what's the sine of uh, 30 degrees? 1 half. So what does this turn out to be? Um, so that's 10 root 2 on the top divided by a half. You flip and multiply. 20 root 2. What units are we in? Well, I didn't give you any units. Let's say for the sake of argument, we're in inches. So what would your answer for little a be? Inches, because that's a, a length measurement, right? Make sense? So if you're given units, make sure you write them down. Now, it says solve the triangle, which means you've got to find all the missing bits, missing angles, all the missing sides, you know. Whatever you're not given, find. So we're not done. All right, well, let's go back. Um, what are we missing? I mean, you could draw the picture for this if you want. But you could also figure it out just by listing the letters in your head. We're missing the stuff involving C, big C, the angle C, and that's big C, and then little c, the length of side C, right? So how are we going to find those? And uh, for the angle, at least, uh, what you're saying is the other subtraction formula. Yeah, so we know, now we know two of the angles, don't we? Well, actually, we already knew them. Yeah. So we can get the third angle, not by using the law of sines, just by using the fact that the angles in a triangle add up to be 180 degrees, right? We could have done that at the, at the beginning uh, if, if we had wanted to. It doesn't, doesn't matter when you do it. So we're going to take 180 minus 135 minus 30, and that's going to be the angle measure for angle C. So C, angle C, to, to indicate that it's kind of a uppercase, I'll put some fancy tails here. Angle C is 180 minus, what did I say, 135 minus 30. Minus 30. What does that leave me with? 15, maybe? Yeah, because that'll be 165 right there oh, that you're yeah. subtracting off. So 15 degrees. I'm subtracting 190. Okay, uh, so what are we missing now? So you're going to be looking for three bits of information, usually, and we found two bits of information. So we need the third bit, which is going to be what? Side C. The length of side C. Now, I don't think we have a choice, so we're looking for the length of side C, which in our picture is that, not that you need the picture. I don't think we have a choice. I think we have to apply the law of sines again. But it's important to realize you're just going to kind of copy what you've already done and fill in a, 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 a couple of different bits of information. In other words, you're still going to use the information involving the A's, the 20 over sine 30. You're still going to use that information because um, Oh, I was wrong. It's the information involving the Bs. You're still going to use that information because that's the, the two bits of information. The Bs are what you know everything about. So you need that ratio from the law of sines. You need that ratio to find the stuff involving the Cs because you only, you only know the angle C at this point. Okay? So when we go ahead and redo the law of sines then, we're going to take, okay, what's the ratio involving the Bs? It's the same as it was before. It's the 20 over sine 30. And yes, we know what sine of 30 is, but normally we won't. So I'm going to go ahead and re redo that ratio. So you, you know B sine B is 20 over sine 30. And then what's the ratio with the C's? So C is what we're missing, little c over sine of big C, which is we just found is 15. And then we could multiply both sides by sine of 15. And so in, in a sort of exact symbolism, we have 20 sine of 15 over sine of 30. But we don't have a real easy way to get sine of 15. We could do it using trig identities, but we're not messing with that here. So and in the homework, you're just going to be told to get a decimal approximation accurate to so many decimal places. 
we're plugging in uh, 20 sine 15 and then dividing by sine 30. Just do it, if you're not in the habit of, of this, do it all at once. First of all, make sure you're in uh, degree mode, I am. And then type in uh, 20, do, type it all in at once, 20 sine 15, don't forget to close the parentheses around the 15, divided by um, sine of 30. Of course, that's one half, but normally you're not gonna have a nice angle there. So just type it all in the way it looks. Does that make sense? And then uh, hit enter, and we get about 10, If it depends on how far we're rounding, 10.4 if we round to one place past the decimal. 10.4 what? It's a length measurement, so it's about 10.4 inches. Okay, so we have our, our three bits of missing information. That means we've solved the triangle. Okay, guys, before we move on to the next example, let me give you a little more explanation concerning the ambiguous case, which is when you're given a side, another side, and a not included angle and you want to see if you can form a triangle out of, uh, out of these bits of information. So in the drawing I have constructed for you, we're given the two sides in red, BC and, and AB, and also angle A. Those are all fixed, nothing else is fixed. Then you can see we can create a triangle ABC perhaps out of the two given sides and the non-included angle. But there's another triangle that fits this information. All I have to do is treat B like a, a kind of hinge and move BC over, keep, try and keep the same length over like so, and C is over here, and this new triangle has this, uh, you know, we're, we're pretending, like I didn't change the length of, of, of side BC, so this new triangle has uh, BC and AB the same lengths as the other triangle, angle A is still fixed, but it's a different triangle, AC is a different length. So that's why we call side-side angle the ambiguous case. Also, uh, by the way, uh, so you can get two different triangles, but you could also get no triangles. What if, what if this side is too short? What if BC, the end, the end of this line segment being C, what if that line is too short to even form a triangle? Then no triangles are formed. So with the side, side angle case, you can have, given a side, a side, and a non-included angle, you could have um, zero triangles formed. You could have one triangle formed, that can happen, and you can have as many as two triangles formed. That's why we call it the ambiguous case. Let's look at this case. Now I didn't tell you which case we're in, right? Remember there's, uh, by labeling the sides and the given sides, the given angles, you can figure out which case you're in. So we're given, uh, it looks like two sides. A is 12 units, whatever the units are. B is 31 units. And angle A is uh, 20.5 degrees. So we're given two sides and an angle. And so there's a couple different orders in which, the, in which you can get two sides and an angle. You can get two non-included sides and an angle, in which case we, we would say that's the side-side angle case. We don't spell it the other way around because it spells a, I don't know if it's a bad word, but it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's not a tasteful word. Let's say, put it that way. So we, we go SSA instead of ASS. Um, and so uh, is it that situation where we're given two sides and a non-included angle? Or is it the situation where we have a side, an included angle, and a side, the side angle side situation? And how do you know without having to draw that silly picture? I'll tell you. If it's side angle side, then all the letters are different. And I'll encourage you, draw, it, draw a triangle where you're given two sides and an included angle. There's no way you can draw it without having all the letters different, okay? And if you can remember that, you'd never have to draw a picture to figure out if, it, because it's important to know whether or not you're in side angle side or side side angle case, right? Because one, of, one case is ambiguous. Side side angle, when the angle is not included, that's the ambiguous case. And, and you're not assured to get a single answer there, okay? But if you're given side angle side, oh, by the way, in side angle side, you use the law of cosines, not the law of sines. So it's important to know what you're given. Okay, are all the letters different? 
No. So this is the side-side angle case. Isn't that a neat way to remember it without having to draw a picture every, every time? Trust me, it is. This is ambiguous, you guys. You, with the ambiguous case, you always use law of signs, and you can figure out whether or not you, have a, whether or not you actually have a triangle, one, no, tri no triangles, one triangle, or two triangles that satisfy the given information. And so I'll show you exactly how to do it. You don't try to predict, you just go through the motions and, and you, you, let it, you let the answer fall out kind of naturally. Okay, so let's create the known ratio. Anytime you're using the law, if the law of signs is gonna work, one of those ratios, A sine A or B sine B or C sine C, one of those ratios, you're gonna have to know both the numerator and the angle in the denominator. Is there, uh, is there enough information to, to know one of those ratios in full? Which one? Uh, a and C. A's, right? Well, A's. A's. So what's the known ratio then involving the A's? Uh, 12 over sine 24. Yeah, so write that down. I like to put that on the right because I like to have my unknown on the left. So that's supposed to be a 0.5 right there. Let me redraw that. Okay, does everybody see where I got that? That's A sine A right there. And that's from the given information. And then you're going to use, you've got one more bit of information you can make use of, right? So you're going, to use, you're going to create the ratio involving that bit of information you know and then also what you don't know. So what's the other um, ratio? Well, it's got to involve the one we haven't used yet, B's, right? So what, how would you create it? It would be B sine B would be 31. It's the, me, it's the length measurement on top. And then sine of... B is the unknown, so you just leave it B. <laughs> leave it B? Okay. That's an ambiguous case. Uh, leave it B. Never mind. In my mind, it's funny. It just doesn't always come out funny. Um, so let's work on solving. By the way, this is a trig equation, isn't it? It has just a single trig function in it, right, where you have the sign of some unknown value. So what, what's the rule then? Going back to the last section, what's the rule when you have a single trig function brought to the first power, what do you do to solve it? You treat it like a linear equation, don't you? And you isolate, in this case, the sine of b. You isolate the trig function. So what's the best way for doing that when you have a single fraction on one side, a single fraction on the other, what's a nice trick? Cross multiply, so you could take 12 sine b and put that on the left side. And then what would go on the right side? 31 sine 20.5. And then uh, we, wanna, we, we haven't quite isolated sine b, so what, what's sine b by itself? What do I do to the right side? Divide by 12. So I have sine B is equal to 31 sine of 20.5 degrees over 12. Everybody agree with that? Okay. Before you take the sine inverse of both sides, run the right-hand side through your calculator and see what it looks like. So uh, I'm going to do that. Uh, make sure you're in degree mode, and then take 31 sine of 20.5, divide by 12. I get a positive number that's less than 1. So there's definitely a solution to this, right? What if that number had been bigger than 1? You'd be done. You'd say there's no triangle that works, okay? And I think that'll probably happen in the homework. But it's a positive number bigger than 1, so that means b is in which quadrant? Since sine of b is positive 0.9, approximately, you know that the angle b is an acute angle in the first quadrant. Okay, uh, well, uh, I mean, maybe, right? Is there another quadrant where the sine could be positive? The second quadrant. Well, that's why it's ambiguous, huh? All right, so let's talk about the angle B in the first quadrant. That's a good place to start. So how do I find angle B in the first quadrant? 
that's what the sine inverse is good for, right? So one, to, this, this sine inverse is only going to work to get the acute angle here. But uh, let's go ahead and take then the sine inverse of both sides. And everything's going to be an estimate here because we're not dealing with nice angles, are we? So everything's an estimate. Take the sine inverse of both sides. I get what? I get B is equal to the sine inverse of this fun stuff. Um, let's go ahead and now use our calculator to estimate that. We already have the stuff in blue typed in the calculator. So all I have to do is go second function sine inverse. Second function, the negative button gets you to the ANS, which is the last output, which is the stuff in blue. Close the parenthesis, although you don't really have to here. Whoops. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Okay, hit enter. And of course, sine inverse is only going to spit out angles in the first quadrant and angles in the fourth when the thing you're taking the sine inverse of is negative, but that's not the case here. So you're, uh, the only angle in, the tri in a triangle that sine inverse is going to spit out is the acute one. So about 64.8 degrees, let's say. But you guys know in a triangle, you can have an obtuse angle, right? An angle in the second quadrant, which the sine inverse doesn't tell you about. So you've got to find it yourself using reference angles. So treat 64.8 as the reference angle. What's another, po and by the way, this is approximate, right? Uh, what's another possible value then for B, for the angle B? 180 minus 64.8 degrees, right? Make sense? What is 180 minus 64.8? 115.2? Sounds right. Okay. So, guys, there, there are two cases. That's why we call this the ambiguous case. Case one, you get a triangle where angle B is 64.8. Case two, you get a triangle where angle B is 115.2. And what you're going to do is, is split it. You're going to solve the triangle for when B is 64.8 degrees, and then you're going to go back and get another triangle where B is 115.2. Okay, well, we can do that. So um, if B is 64.8, then uh, what does that immediately allow us to get? C, angle C, right? Yeah. So I could take 180. Now, now we're thinking of the triangle. To get the third angle in the triangle, then I could take 180 minus the given angle A, 20.5, minus the angle we found for B, one of the angles we found for B, 64.8. And so I get that angle C is equal to 180 minus 64.8 uh, minus 20.5. And so what is, and it is, everything's approximate at this point, guys. So what does that turn out to be? I get, uh, you can't see it on the big one, on the big screen, but it's 94.7 degrees. So um, that's two out of the three missing bits of information, isn't it? For this, for this case one triangle. This case one corresponds to one triangle, case two corresponds to another triangle. Uh, so what else do we need? If we have Angle, if we have all three angles, we're given one and we have the other two, what, what else are we missing? Side C. Okay, so now we're going to go and repeat some of the work we've already done. Let's set up the known ratio, which is 12, the sine of 20.5, right? So 12 to sine of 20.5 degrees. And then we want side C. So what's that ratio involving the C's, involving what we know and what we don't know? C over, C over sine of the angle we just found, right? 94 point, 
seven. Now, by the way, there's gonna be round off error here. So the, if you wanna put in a more accurate estimate of your angle, there'll be less round off error, but at this point, we're not gonna worry about it, okay? So it's not coming from this part, but it's coming from where I rounded uh, this, this angle off to 64.8. So there is round off error there, and there will be some variability in your answers. Okay, so to solve this, what do I do? I get little c is equal to, and again, I'm using equal, but it's all approximately equal at this point, sine of 94.7 degrees over sine of 20.5. Does everybody agree with that? Any questions there? Okay, run it through your calculator. Tell me what you get. 34.8. One five, we only went to one decimal place in the other one though, so point two. Okay, and that's we. we I didn't give you units, so I'm just going to say, it's it's length units or whatever. Okay, so then uh, that gives us three pieces of information, right? Under this case, that is, for case one, we've got a triangle then with the given measurements, and then uh, angle B sixty four point eight, angle C ninety four point seven and angle C, 34.2. But there's a whole other triangle that satisfies the given information, and that's case two. And you have to find the three missing bits there. So you get double your pleasure here, right? You get uh, to do two problems in one, more for your tuition dollar. So here we go, let's, let's solve the other triangle and then that'll do it for today. So now we're gonna mirror what we just did, except B is 115.2, but you can kind of cheat you don't want to think too hard, look at what you just did. In uh, when B was 64.8, what did you do to get angle C? Yeah, 180 minus, uh, well, the 115.2, not 164.8. Not, not and then the other one you subtract was the given angle of 20.5 degrees, so that stays the same. And so you guys run that through your calculators for me. What do you get? 40. 4.3? Okay, sounds like Mission Control has it. All right, <laughs> uh, so we have um, that bit, uh, that bit. We need one more bit of information. Look at what you did right here and just kind of mirror what you did right there with uh, the new uh, angle C. So what's the, what's the ratio is going to look like? C to sine of 44.3 equals the, the same thing, right? 12 over sine of 20.5. What do you multiply both sides by? So this denominator, so you get C is equal to, really it's approximately equal to sine, 12 sine 44.3 over sine 20.5 degrees. Okay, that's a weird looking four, but run that through your calculator. 23.9. And that's in units, length units, right? So now we've got three bits of information under case two. So we ended up with two different triangles that satisfied the given information.